Hi, this is Jonas from VHGLWiz.com. In this video, I'm going to show you how to create a clocked process in VHGL. In the last tutorial, we implemented a multiplexer in this process right here. In the sensitivity list, we listed all the signals that are being evaluated within the process, just as we learned to do back in tutorial number 9, which was about sensitivity lists. These signals are inputs to the process. Whenever one of them change, the process will wake up and the output signal will change accordingly. This is how a multiplexer is supposed to work, so in this case, that's what we want. But try to imagine building a complex system using only asynchronous logic like this. It's impossible. Our human brains are not able to comprehend that many levels of simultaneous cause and effect. That's why we invented clocked logic, sometimes referred to as sequential logic. In a clocked logic design, everything happens in sync with the clock signal. This master clock effectively creates time steps in a logic, where all changes happen only at the clock edges. The basic building block of clock logic is a component called the flip-flop, and that's what we're going to create in this video. To get us started, I'm going to go over to the test bench which we created in the previous tutorial. I'm going to copy the code to a new file which I will name t17 for tutorial number 17, underscore clockedprocesstb.vhd. Change the entity names as well. Then I'm going to delete all of the signals and both of the processes. The first thing we're going to do is to declare the clock signal. Let's name it CLK for clock, and the type is going to be standard logic. I'll give it an initial value of 1. Then I'll declare a constant which is going to determine the clock frequency in our test bench. It's going to be of type integer, and I'm going to give it an initial value of 100 million. I want this design to run at 100 MHz. On the next line I'll declare another constant which is going to be the clock period. The type of this signal is time. It's the VHDL type used for specifying time values. The value we assign to the clock period constant is going to be derived from the clock frequency constant. I usually do this by typing 1000 ms divided by clock frequency. Dividing the time value of 1000 milliseconds by the clock frequency is a trick for converting the frequency in hertz to the period time of that frequency. The next thing we need is a process for creating the clock signal. I'll type directly in the architecture, clock gets the value of not clock after clock period divided by 2. This is a shorthand notation for creating a process which will fire with a fixed time interval. Here we assign to clock the value of not clock. The clock signal initially has the value of 1, and not 1 is 0. The clock signal will alternate between 1 and 0, and this is going to happen with the interval of clock period divided by 2, meaning that this process is going to fire with a rate of double the clock frequency. Alright, let's save this file and see what our clock signal looks like in simulation. And here it is. This is what the clock signal looks like in the waveform. What we need to concentrate on are these edges, the rising edges of the clock signal, because that's where stuff happens in the clock design. In fact, ModelSim has buttons for it. If we hover over this button right here, the tooltip says, find next rising edge. Every time we press it, the cursor will skip to the next rising edge. There's also a find previous rising edge button which searches backwards. If we press this button which inserts a new cursor in the waveform, we can use the two cursors to measure the period of the clock signal. By placing them at two adjacent rising edges, we can see that the time in between them is 10 nanoseconds. The inverse of 10 nanos is 100 million, 100 megahertz. Now it's time to create the flip-flop module. To get started, let's copy this code and paste it into a new file which I will name t17 underscore flipflop.vhd. Of course, we need to change the entity names, but we should also change the architecture name sim to something else. We copied this code from the test bench, and sim indicates that this is a simulation file. Let's change it to RTL, indicating that the abstraction level of this module is at the register transfer level. By the way, when we use the word register, we generally mean flip-flop, which is the component that we are about to create right now. First, we're gonna erase all of the signals and processes, because that belongs to the test bench code. This is a module, so we got to declare some input and output signals. We do that inside of the entity by creating a port. The first input is going to be the clock signal. The next input that we need is the reset signal. A negative reset signal in our case, meaning that the module will reset when this signal is zero. Then we need an input signal which I will name simply input, also this a single bit style logic. Finally, we create a signal with the name output and data direction out. Down in the architecture, we're gonna implement our flip-flop in a clocked process. To create a clocked process, we start by typing process then, in the sensitivity list, we list only one signal, the clock signal. Let's create the begin and end tags for our process. This process is gonna wake up when, and only when, the clock signal changes. Then, the code that we put inside of here will be executed. 
The first line we write inside of the process is if rising edge, start parenthesis, inside of the parenthesis we list the clock signal. Let's just close off this if branch with an end if tag. The rising edge statement which we entered is actually a function call. This process will wake up whenever the clock signal changes, whether it changes from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1. If the clock signal changes from 0 to 1, then that is a rising edge, and the rising edge function will return true. The result is that whatever code we put inside of the if branch here will be executed only on the rising edge of the clock. The first thing we always create in our process is the reset logic. If the negative reset signal is active, I want to set the output to 0. On the next line, we'll use the else keyword. The program will enter this branch only if the module is not in reset. Inside of here, we'll give the output signal the value of the input signal. And that's all. After we close off the else branch with an end if tag, our flip-flop module is complete. We've now created a flip-flop with synchronized reset. The reset logic here is inside of the if rising edge branch. The reset is synchronized with the clock. Now, let's head over to our test bench and create an instance of the module there. I'll type out a standard module instantiation just as we learned in tutorial number 15. On the next line, in the port map, we have to map the module's inputs and outputs to local signals declared in the test bench. We'll connect the clock input to the clock signal which we already have created. The next input was n reset, which will map to an n reset signal which I will create just now. Then comes the input signal which we'll also create, and finally the output signal. When we instantiate a production module in a test bench, it is often referred to as the device under test, or DOT for short. Let's save this file and add a new flip-flop module to our model sim project. We have to compile the two files in the right order, first a flip-flop module and then a test bench. Then we're gonna restart the simulation, add a new signal to the waveform and press the run button. If we go to the start of the timeline, we can see that the input signal has the value 0, which is the initial value that we gave it. The output signal has the U value, meaning uninitialized. But at the first rising edge of the clock, the output changes to 0. This is because the module is in reset. We gave the reset value an initial value of 0. When using negative reset logic like we did, 0 will cause the module to reset. An important observation is that even though the reset signal was 0 right from the start, the output didn't change until the first rising edge of the clock. To investigate the behavior of the flip-flop module a bit further, we are going to create a test bench sequence. I'll start by opening a new process using the process isBegin keyword. The first thing we'll do is to take the dot out of reset by setting the reset signal to 1. Then we'll wait 20 nanoseconds, which should equal 2 clock cycles at 100 MHz. After the 20 nanoseconds, we'll set the input signal to 1. Then we'll wait for 22 nanoseconds, which should bring us 2 clock cycles ahead and a bit more. Now we're setting the input signal back to 0 before waiting 6 nanoseconds. 6 nanoseconds is less than one clock period, and now the input signal is completely out of sync with the clock. Finally, we'll set the input to 1 again, and wait for another 20 nanoseconds. After that, I'll reset the dot and throw in a single wait statement to prevent the program from looping back to the start of the process. Let's save this file, recompile the test bench, and restart the simulation. Immediately, we see that there's a bit more activity on the input and output signal. Before we try to understand what's happening, I'll show you a little trick in model sim when working with clock designs. I'll select the clock signal and use the Find Next Rising Edge button. The cursor will jump to the next rising edge of the clock. This is useful when working with clock designs, because we are really only interested in what happens at the clock edges. Similarly, we can use the Find Previous Rising Edge button for going backwards in the timeline. Alright, let's focus on the first transition of the input signal, which is from 0 to 1 at 20 nanoseconds simulation time. The change happens on the exact same time of the rising edge of the clock signal, so why is the output signal unaffected? When I first started learning VSGL, I had a hard time understanding this basic behavior of clock logic, but it is really quite simple. The rising edge of the clock causes the flip-flop to copy the value of the input signal to the output signal. The value of the input signal is changing at that exact time, but it won't become effective until the next simulator time step. Therefore, the flip-flop sees the old value of the input signal, which is zero. This is how VHGL simulators work, and this is how it's got to be. Things happen in zero time. When the rising edge of the clock happens, our flip-flop module copies the input value to the output in zero time. In the real world, a flip-flop would use a couple of nanoseconds for copying the input to the output. Changing the input at the rising edge of the clock would cause the output to be undetermined, because we don't know exactly which value the flip-flop sees. It's important to understand that this is a simulation. This is how we design digital logic, and this is how a simulation is supposed to behave, even if it doesn't look like this in the real world. Okay, let's skip a few clock cycles ahead. Here, the input signal changes from 1 to 0 to nanoseconds after the clock. 
it then changes back to 1 again 2 nanoseconds before the next rising edge of the clock. Now what happened to the output signal? Nothing at all. The short dip in the input signal was completely ignored. This is because it happened in between two rising edges. The flip flop samples only on rising edges, so it didn't see that the input signal had been changing in the meantime. Again, this is how clocked logic is supposed to work. Finally, at the end of our timeline, the output signal changes to zero. This is because of the reset signal which we set to zero at the end of our test bench sequence. Because we implemented the synchronous reset logic, this too happens on the rising edge of the clock. That's enough experiments for today. I'll end this tutorial with showing the symbol for the flip-flop. There are different variants of it. Some use positive or asynchronous reset and some have an inverted output as well, but basically they all do the same thing. Normally we don't create dedicated flip-flop models like we did just now, we create models that do other stuff. But when you create a process that is sensitive to the clock, flip-flops will have to be used behind the scenes to implement your design on chip. That's all I had for you in this video, thank you for watching and head over to vhglwist.com for more tutorials and blog posts.